right on. Um, thank you so much again for joining and uh, thank you Dress for Success for uh, inviting me to uh, present my information about how to negotiate a salary. Um, I just wanna tell you a little bit about me just to start. Um, first things first, I'm a mother of a seven month old. Uh, so she's brand new uh, and that's been a really good time <laughs> getting to do that. That's the first time I'm, I'm a mom. Um, I'm also a sales manager in the ad tech space. Uh, I'm a post-grad sessional instructor in uh, instructor in media negotiation and sales. I'm also on the board of directors for St. Clair's Multi-Faith Housing, uh, and I'm currently working on a couple of marketing initiatives for them. And, and um, you may or may not know this, but the reason I'm actually connected with Dress for Success is I'm a person with lived experience with homelessness. And so I actually have uh, leveraged a Dress for Success uh, as a way to sort of get off the streets and be able to find um, employment myself. So uh, I'm very, very excited to be here and to kind of walk everybody through um, how to negotiate a, a salary because it is very, very important, I think, in this day and age. I'm very passionate about negotiating salaries because I remember once working as a temp uh, and it was a photocopying job and there were several of us from the same temp agency. And one day this guy comes up to me and asks me how much I made per hour. And I didn't know at the time, but there's a strict policy about this not disclosing your pay to the other temps. Uh, but I told them my number because, again, I didn't really know at the time. And at the time, it was like nine bucks or so. Uh, and naturally and curiously, I asked him, you know, how much do you make? And he said, 12. Um, and I was, I was livid. I mean, how are we doing the same job? And he's making more than me. Was this like a sexist thing? Am I missing out on some information? So I decided to literally call the temp agent and ask them, you know, how is what's his name making three full dollars more than me? And she takes this deep breath and she says, she says to me, he asked for more. I'm sorry, I think this glitched out on us, but <laughs> he asked for more. And that was it. That's all it literally took for something inside me to shift and realize I need to ask for more money every single time. But asking for money isn't really easy, right? Negotiating your salary isn't very easy. I mean, I was worried in that process too. Uh, questions like, is my salary expectation too high? If it is, would I lose this opportunity to actually work? Um, this is often caused by this asymmetry of information in the job market. Um, if I pull a number out for my salary um, and it's too high or it's too low, am I going to look like I don't understand the job and I don't understand the role? Uh, am I going to embarrass myself? And how how do I even know how to actually ask for the salary without sounding demanding? Do I need to worry about sounding demanding? Um, and what if I asked for a salary and it's not even enough? What if I could have gotten more? And these are all very, very common fears. Um, and I think what this workshop is going to focus on, and I'm hoping to walk you through, is how to understand how to determine your salary expectations. How do you even ask for it? What are the words you should use? And what if you get the offer, but it's too low? What do you do then? What this workshop isn't though, and it isn't a TED talk about your self-worth because you are 100% worth it. You deserve everything you ask for. And that's it. And that's all. That's a fact. So if you do need some motivation, and believe me, I do too sometimes, there are about a million TED Talks online and motivational videos online that you can watch and pump yourself up before an interview. But for today's workshop, we're going to just focus on all the good practical stuff about negotiating salary. So it always starts the same, right? You submit a resume and a recruiter or an HR person calls you for a pre-screening part of the interview. And they'll ask you at some point, what is your salary expectation? If they don't ask you, you're going to want to ask that at the end of this pre-screening part of the interview. You're going to want to make sure that you actually ask this question. Um, so you're probably thinking, if someone asks you, what's your salary expectation? You're probably thinking, where do I even start? What should I even consider about my own uh, experience or my own employer, how do I kind of move forward? Think of your, think of creating your salary expectation as building a cake. Let's start with a base number, okay? What are you currently getting paid if you're getting paid? <laughs> What's, that's the absolute base number. You don't want to go under that number if you don't have to, okay? 
Then you're going to consider what is the average salary for the role in your city, in your industry. You can look these things up on like payscale.com or uh, glassdoor.com. You can look all this information up. But what's important to note here is looking at the city that you live in and the industry for that. Um, the reason why is because oftentimes the finance department that actually approves your salary is going to keep in mind the cost of living in your city. I mean, a lot of us live in Toronto. <laughs> Toronto is wicked expensive. <laughs> and sometimes you get a salary back and you're like, ah, this is not livable in this city. But I promise they are considering this when they are um, looking at that actual number in their offer for you. Another way you can find out is to ask a senior mentor who doesn't work in your current or previous place of employment. Um, the reason why you don't want to ask someone who you've worked for or has worked in the same company or is going to work in the potential same company is because there can be some sensitive information there, especially if um, you could be working for them at some point. Um, they don't want to give away the corporate pay scale that exists um, and like how managers get paid. And so sometimes there could be some sensitivities, but it is still worth reaching out to someone if you have like a great relationship with them. Another person, another way you can kind of find this information out is asking a peer, uh, but hopefully it's a peer at a senior level, a couple levels up maybe, again, who you haven't worked with or won't be working with in the future, but works in the same industry. Doing this is going to give you a solid range to kind of work in as your base number. And that's the first part of starting to begin to determine your salary expectation. Now you have to consider the second part. You have this base number and now you're going to layer on some more information and we're going to work on this part as a multiplier kind of system. Okay. So are you a female or identifying as female? If you are, add 10% more than your base. Are you part of the BIPOC or LGBTQ2S plus community? Are you differently abled? If you've answered yes to any of these, add 10% more. The reason why is because people who often experience these characteristics or are these characteristics, they often downplay their salaries in their mind. Um, so we often start much lower than our counterparts. And that's why we want to just level set that back up to the right place that it should be. And so that's why we say, jump your salary a little bit and add yourself a little multiplier. Um, let's talk about your experience though. How many years of experience do you have? Add 2% for like every year that you, you've worked in this industry. Is your current role, is it more senior to the role you're applying? Um, did you get promoted while you were in the current role? If you were, then you can start adding a couple thousand, 2%, uh, up to 5%. Add numbers, start to add your numbers and grow that salary expectation. You're increasing your expectation based off the fact that you have proven success in your previous roles. Another thing to consider is, did you win any awards in your previous role? Uh, you know, if there's a corporate organizational role that says, you know, you've won the role uh, award for um, being the most responsible, or you've won an award for uh, nonstop attendance, <laughs> whatever, whatever the little goals are, um, consider adding 1% for these things. Do you have any licenses or certifications that you got during your job? Add another 1%. Another thing that people often overlook is did you do you volunteer anywhere um, where you keep a leadership position? So a board of directors or a supervisor or volunteer, something where you show some form of leadership. You can add 1% again here as a multiplier. These qualifications, this like little group of qualifications, they show that you have some kind of leadership trait and you offer yourself up as a responsible person. Did you contribute to your employer outside of your day-to-day -day responsibilities? That means like, did you join the social community? Did you start a fundraiser? Did you initiate a project that led to some sort of growth in the organization? You can add 2% for that. You can multiply your, your base salary by 2%. Um, and then finally, did you apply for this job or were you recruited? If you applied, you can't really add very much dollars to this, but if you were recruited, you can, you can increase your salary expectation. These qualifications show that you are oriented with the overall organizational goals and that you work outside of your day-to-day -to, -day to support the organization as a whole. And all of these things that I've listed here, except for, you know, one to four, 
basically five to about 11. All of these things are what you're going to want to highlight either in your resume or in the pre-screening call, you're going to want to discuss these things as part of your, um, your, you know, your best foot forward. This is how many years of experience I have. I'm actually in a senior role. I actually got promoted in that the current job that I'm in. I'm licensed and certified in this way. And I'm also on the volunteering. Uh, I'm also volunteering with animals where I lead a group of 10 people. All of these things are going to be highlighted and it's going to outline for the recruiter or the HR person why you deserve the salary you're going to ask for. But again, your interview and your salary isn't just about you. I know a lot of people think and they get very nervous that an interview is about yourself, but it's also an opportunity for your employer to prove to them, to prove to you that they deserve you. So they got to earn you too. So we need to think of, we need to do some kind of quick math as you start asking your HR or recruiter um, about the, the company that you're applying for. For instance, was this company making any good headlines in the news? Uh, things like a new product launch, an inc increased level of service, good CSR stuff. They won an award. They had a merger. They're having growth. If that's the case, you can add like 2.5% multipliers, right? Or were they in the news for something bad, like inappropriate behaviors, issues with turnovers, tech outages, like Facebook, uh, public disgracing issues, CEOs quitting, IP backing out of IPOs. If so, you can minus 2.5% because that typically means that they don't have a lot of funding and they're trying to reestablish themselves um, as an organization. And they're, they're looking for people to kind of get fresh blood in there. Is the employer a startup or are they well-established? What, you, what you're trying to assess here is, are they growing um, and how fast a startup can have no funding and may not have as much money, but a startup with series funding could have more money. These are things you should probably ask during your interview with the recruiter uh, or the HR person that you're speaking with. An established organization may have some money, but it's always gonna depend on their growth strategy. So researching this for asking the recruiter or HR person is gonna help gauge whether you should add 1% or minus 1%. If they're in growth mode, you can increase your salary expectation. If they're in stabilizing mode, then you probably shouldn't. Um, do they have investors? Are they public or private? All of these things are going to help you establish that. Another thing you want to also ask is, you know, is the team you're joining small? Have they been small for a while? How many hires have they had in the past quarter or even the past year? Another great question is, are you replacing an employee or are you adding to an existing team? Knowing this is going to help you determine if they're in growth mode again or if they're in stabilizing mode, right? Knowing this will help you see if you should multiply your base salary, what the number you have now by 2% or not. Another question to ask is, is related to accountability in your new, your new role, the role you're applying for. Are you leading a team? How much risk is your new role? How much accountability do you carry in this new role? Knowing how much risk this new job is going to give you, and typically the higher up you go, I often make this joke that like the CEO looks like they're doing nothing. Uh, it looks like they don't do as much work as everybody else underneath them, but the CEO gets paid the most. And so my question used to be, why? And it's because the CEO has the most risk. Everything we do underneath the CEO is basically the CEO's fault. And so that's why they get paid the big dollars to tolerate that, to handle that, to take the fall for it and fall on their sword for it. And so in those cases, you want to understand where you fall within that accountability, um, that level of accountability. And the more risk you take, the more you can multiply this base salary. Another great question that sometimes people overlook too is what is the average age of your workforce? Knowing this is going to tell you a ton. Um, in my experience, a younger workforce often means lower salaries, but ambitious goals. Uh, an older workforce usually means aligning salaries with people who are often trying to keep a home and a family and have investments. Um, so people who are, tend to be younger will often take lesser salaries and have uh, loftier goals to hit that gives them other rewards. So that's something to keep in mind too. Um, is the role remote? Is there an office? Having no office oftentimes means there's additional finances available to give it to you if you want a higher salary. 
Um, so you can ask for more money if now, especially now as we're moving out of, uh, you know, the, the, wor the working in office settings. So these are a ton of questions. And again, these are all the questions that you can either do as research beforehand, particularly ones related to the company being in the news, or you can ask the HR person or recruiter on the call, because remember, they're interviewing you, but you're interviewing them. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you ask these questions and then you're going to have to do some quick math while you talk. But having this is going to give you a general idea of your base number, your, your salary expectations. So as we talk about that, the next question is, how do you actually ask for it? What do you actually say? Um, always remember, this is about the work you've accomplished and the work that you are about to do. So it's not just about what you've done, it's what you're going to be required to do as you move into this new role. It's not personal. They don't really know you as a person. They don't know about your children, your relationships, or that you're a great gardener, okay? They don't know anything about you. But this is part of the process. And it's very important to remember that you and every other person that they're currently interviewing is negotiating a salary. So by not negotiating a salary, you're probably standing out in a kind of an awkward way. <laughs> um, but it's also seen as a strength that you can negotiate your salary. So a lot of people and I, you know, people that are really good friends of mine have often said that they've gone to interviews and said, yeah, like whatever the salary is, is fine because they're so anxious about actually saying a number. Uh, and they really do believe whatever the number is fine. And they think if they start negotiating for a number, it's going to make them look strange or awkward. But realistically, the HR person and recruiter is very used to this and is hoping you will stand up for yourself. It's a sign of your own strength and that you're confident. Um, another thing that you have to remember, if someone asks you, even if it's a recruiter or HR person, and they ask you, what is your salary expectation over an email? Do not answer it over an email. <laughs> <laughs> Never answer it over an email. It is very tough to detect your tone over an email. So the best thing you want to do is probably ask them in an email if you can jump on a quick call so you can sort of uh, discuss uh, your salary expectations again. Um, and sometimes we'll see, you know, recruiters and HR people, they will often um, ask this question over an email, even though they know the answer. And they'll just try to see if you're willing to change your mind about the salary. Sometimes that has happened. It's always best to make sure that you jump on a call with them. You want to do this because you want to make sure the tone of your voice is fair, friendly, but very firm, rather than coming off threatening or demanding. Um, a lot of people worry about, I'm going to sound demanding, um, and should we sound demanding? And then there's a school of thought, yes, we should be demanding. Why shouldn't we be demanding? The fact is, um, we're just people. <laughs> and, and Demanding anything from anyone is never a good look. Uh, you want to be very respectful, but you want to be firm and confident as well. So it's always best to jump on a call um, when you're doing this. Um, you know, like I was saying, it, it the idea of being demanding, it, it, it can apply to both genders, but we know that it often is skewed disproportionately to women, that asking for something can sometimes make us look too demanding and that can work against us. So it's best to just get on a call anyways. Um, another thing to remember, don't give them a range. <laughs> don't ever say between this and this because they'll never, they'll never take you up on the higher end of that range. And what they do know from this information is that you'll accept the lower end of the range. So giving them a range is kind of this moot point, it's kind of useless. Just give them a firm number. The last thing to also, also remember, or the second last thing to remember is that whatever number you give them, they're going to come under it. <laughs> they're, it's very, very rare that they actually just give you the number. They usually just come under it just by a little bit. It's part of their own negotiating tactics. It's part of something that, you know, HR is also a job. They also have things that they have to accomplish and their goals. And part of it may be to come underneath what your expectations were. So keep that in mind as you do ask for um, your salary. Um, and keep in mind that they have other candidates that they're balancing out the salaries for um, and other employees that they're balancing the salaries for. So their number is not often just based off your market and your role, but it's also based off a corporate salary scale. So they're thinking like if your manager makes, you know, only 10K more than what you're asking for, 
then we better figure out how we change your salary so it's a little more palatable, right? Um, and, and they just want to start you off this way just so that the corporate scale looks good in case they have investors and they need to kind of answer to them. Um, and then the last thing you should also remember before you start, you know, before we dive into the conversation of how do you even ask for the salary is you want to make sure you ask for the salary expectation first. So when you're going through the call, be the first to say, what is the salary expectation for this job? What is in your budget? Um, you may get lucky and they may actually tell you, but nine times out of 10, they'll ask you instead <laughs> what your expectation is. Um, but what's important to remember is that you're going to impress them by asking first because you're going to show them that you are unafraid of talking about numbers and you won't be easily accepting whatever salary they may attempt to put forward. And so by asking first, you're actually showing how confident you are and comfortable you are about knowing your worth when it comes to your salary. So th this is also really important to remember. Okay, let's dive into the meat of this. How do you effectively ask for the salary what words do you use? Do you just say the numbers you blurted out? I find that, uh, and I've used all of these <laughs> in various roles that I've had. If you are being recruited, you can say something like, I would need X dollars to jump. Or you can say, you can say I'm currently being approached with X dollars if you have other offers on the table. Um, don't ever lie. Don't ever say you have other offers on the table if you don't. Uh, it's a bad idea. I know like some people uh, like employ this tactic. I've seen this tactic go very sideways when uh, some recruiters will go through the whole process and then ask you for an offer letter from the other offer, uh, like a copy of it with redacted information. Like it can go very, it can spiral out of control if you lie. So I wouldn't lie, but if you want to say, you know, I need a certain number to, to jump, you can do that. If you are being recruited, you can say things like the market would value me at X dollars, or I'm, I currently would be approached with X dollars. My favorite one, if you aren't being um, uh, recruited, is given my qualification A, B, or parts of the job C, I think X dollars is a great place to begin negotiations. Or uh, given A, B, and C, I think X dollars, I would require X dollars for this position. That's my favorite because what you're doing is you're summarizing your entire pre-screening call. You're summarizing facts about you that stand out the most. And you're also summarizing to them something about the role that is going to be expensive for them. So like, given that this is a very senior level role, given that I am a supervisor in my current role and I have generated X amount of dollars for my current company, I need this dollar for this position. So these are all really great options to use in actual language when you're trying to ask for the salary in the pre-screening call. Now, <laughs> what do you do in the pre-screening call when they say, nope, can't do that, can't give you that number. Uh, that's happened to me too, where I got overly eager and ambitious and I went for that number. Well, if you want the job for reasons outside of the salary and you're willing to drop your expectations, walk it back. I always walk it back because I think there's value in experiencing the full interview. So you can walk it back uh, and say, okay, what is your budget? What is your range? Or you know what, I'd like to continue the interview process and learn more about the role. Can we schedule a meeting with a hiring manager? How's date and time, right? Um, another thing that works really well is I'm willing to negotiate my salary to fit within your range after I learn more about the role and the company. Can we schedule a meeting with the hiring manager? Now, the reason why I say this is not because you want to readjust your confidence or you you're you know worried about how it's going to seem but the goal for you at this point is to get to the end of, end of the interview process an interview is a very hard to get in the first place so getting to the end of the interview process will do a few things one it'll impress them enough to possibly give you a, a good offer at the end of it which has happened to me or Two, it'll give you market research information. You'll understand this company, this job requires this amount of work, and this is the salary they're offering. And so you can say, okay, well, it's a high paying, it's a, it's a low paying job, it's a senior position in a startup, and the workforce is quite young. So maybe I'll look for something similar where the workforce is a little more older, 
and it's in a more established company. And then I could probably get the type of salary I'm looking for. So it's always important to get through the whole interview process. Another reason why you also want to get through that interview process is the more people you talk to in your industry, you'll meet hiring managers, you'll meet the VP, you'll meet whoever it is you need to meet during that interview process. Networking with them is critical to your future success anyways. So as I see it, it's always a win-win-win to get through that interview process. So if you ask for a number and the HR person says, nope, can't do it, sorry about that, you say not a problem at all. I'd still love to go through the interview process and I'm willing to negotiate the salary once I learn more. And usually oftentimes, nine times out of 10, they'll let you just go through the interview process anyways, and you'll get to learn more. And if you really impress them, they might give you an offer at the end of it, which has, which has happened quite a few times to me. So now you've gone through this interview process, right? So you've gone through the pre-screening, you've met everybody you needed to meet, you've done the whole spiel, you've, you've gone in, you've you know showed your best stuff. They give you an offer, okay? And maybe the offer is, if the offer is great, take it, right? You're good to go, you're off to the races. But say the offer is a little lower than you expected uh, and that you had hoped for. There's a few things you should think about. In your career, you're either going to grow, uh, you're either going to learn, or you're going to earn. Uh, some jobs will give you a chance to, to learn more than you're actually earning, and that may be valuable to you. And in some jobs, it's kind of boring, but you earn a lot of money and you kind of do it for a bit just to kind of make that paycheck. Um, the other part of it too is you eventually want to get to a place where you're earning and learning. So you have to balance these ideas out in your mind. Am I learning or am I going to earn here? And if the offer is lower than what you expected, here's a couple things you should ask um, of yourself. Um, is it lower than your minimally accepted salary to maintain your life and lifestyle? Because if it is, it may not be worth it, right? Sometimes the salary is so low, you're like, I can't eat on this. Uh, and so I'm gonna have to turn it down. And it's okay to do that. Um, is the salary lower than what you wanted? Um, is having the job actually adding clout to your resume? I've taken jobs where the salary was so, so bad, but having that name on my resume has actually gotten me double the salary at the next job and triple the salary at the next job. It's been kind of amazing to see how one name has really just given me the most clout in the past 10 years. And I cannot believe that I almost gave up that job because the salary was under 30,000. It was basically, uh, you couldn't live off of it. But I was willing to do it for a year and a half because I needed, I needed the name on my resume. Um, and then, you know, if this is a job you're not going to earn in, but you're going to get a new set of transferable hard skills or have exposure to a new career path or responsibilities that can make you more attractive applicant to future uh, employers, is this something that is going to be valuable to you? So sometimes you take a job and you're like, this is not going to be great. The salary is going to be bogus, but I get to do something that I've never known how to do before. And learning this is going to get me a better salary in a year from now. You have to remember it's, it's a job <laughs> in a year from now, the market's gonna change and new opportunities are going to open up. So don't be scared to take a job for other reasons outside of your salary if the salary does come in a little lower. Um, and finally, it's, it's totally okay to just reject an offer and still stay friends with the people you've interviewed with. Um, I have oftentimes had to say no to an offer, and I've connected with these people that were the hiring managers and the presidents of companies. And over time, because it's still, they're still in the same network you work in. So you don't, in the same industry, so you don't want to alienate them and you don't want to just kind of disappear in the background. You're going to stay friends with them. You're going to talk to them on LinkedIn. You're going to add them on LinkedIn. You're going to have an ongoing relationship because what will happen is this company may one day afford you. I've had companies come back and say, hey, uh, I know we couldn't offer you the salary a year ago, but I think we can offer it now. Are you happy with the place you're employed at? Um, and that opens up a new door for you. Or people just know you and they'll say, hey, actually, I there's a thing that's happening as a side gig. You could do this in the evenings. Would you want to join that? Um, and that kind of can earn you some money. So it's always important to kind of uh, be respectful, even in the whole process of not uh, accepting a sort of a job offer as you go through this. Um, but overall, 
following these uh, steps in this process has definitely helped me uh, garner a, a, an incredibly great salary, a salary I'm very proud of. And it has been uh, an issue where um, it, it hasn't been easy and it's been a growth, uh, you know, a growing process. One of the most recent accounts I have of negotiating my salary is I asked for a number and they came in under and they said, okay, well, we're under by 10,000. We'll give you a $5,000 signing bonus. And uh, I said, okay, well, it's still not the number I want because it's it's lower than what I would I would want. And I, I think I deserve, just give me the five, just give me the extra 10K. Like you have it, <laughs> why can't I have it? And they came back and they said, and, and we, you know, in negotiating and I really wanted to work at this company. They said to me, uh, or rather, I said to them, when is the next time you have a promotion or raise cycle? How does that work in your company? And they said, we actually, you you're eligible for a raise in six months. We do all the raises in January. All the promotions happen in January. It's always cyclical. So you'll qualify for that, but you essentially need to put in six months of really great stellar work, and then you'll qualify for a raise. And I said, well, what is the maximum percentage of raise that you guys offer? And they said up to 10%. So I figured, okay, if I can absolutely crush it for six months, that means when I go in in January, that 10% raise is going to give me more than the 10K I was asking for. So I, I decided that it'd be worth taking a lower salary, knowing that there was potential in there to grow as I continued to go through this process. Um, but these are all wonderful things to consider. Do you guys have any questions about any of this um, that's essentially the entire process beginning to end as I've done it and have found tons of success in. Are there any questions that I can take? Uh, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. <laughs> there are questions. <laughs> um, so when we were talking at the very beginning of different um, barriers that you might have were adding percentage, there was a question that was saying, um, if I'm female and BIPOC, do I add 20% or is it just 10% per uh, thing? I would, I would add 10% for every single one of those that you qualify for. Again, you're, you'd be surprised that we often start so low, the 10% of 30,000 or 40,000 is actually not a lot of money. It sounds like a lot when you're like 20%, but it's actually not. <laughs> you'd be surprised how much money you can get if you really just put the full 20 in there. Okay. And then for each point that you were talking about, you add about 2% for yeah, the ones. Um, I said 2% in mine. Uh, sometimes it was what, like volunteer service is often 1%. I consider it 1%. Uh, you know, certifications is 1%. Think of it this way. Um, you want to add a percent between one and five. Um, the more common or easily accessible it is, like other candidates can do it too, you'd probably be closer to the 1%. If it's something that's really hard, it's going to be 5%. So if we break that down, like getting a certification online, like a Google certification, you literally sign up, you do an exam, a little quiz, you take online courses, and then you, you get certified, right? Anybody under the moon can do that. So that's like a 1% thing. Getting promoted in your job once or twice, that's kind of hard to do. <laughs> and so that's like between a 4 and a 5%. Um, building out an entire piece of process in your company or leading that team into a new process or building out a new piece of technology, that's not a very common opportunity that a lot of people have in their jobs. That would be a 5%. So think of it in terms of how rare something is uh, in terms of the, the characteristic you had. That's when you would add a higher percent. But it's usually between 1 and 5. Okay. Okay. Um, what if the salary is stated in the job description and it says it's non-negotiable? Yes. So if they give you a salary in the job description that says non-negotiable, I would still go through the interview process. <laughs> you, you know what salary they're expecting. I say you go for it anyways. And even if they say, well, no, the salary was stated, it's non-negotiable. You're still a person with incredible skills that you can show off. And at the end of it, even if you say, okay, great, I'll, I'll put up with your smaller salary range than what I would like, going through the full interview process is valuable to you because this is the type of job you want. These are the type of people you want to meet. Understanding that job and why that salary is non-negotiable or within that range is going to be important to you as you apply for your next job if you don't want to take this job because it's a non-negotiable salary. Does that yeah. help? Yeah. Patricia, do you have a question? 
Yeah, I do. If you're going online and the um, application shows that your expected uh, uh, your expected range, what you're asking for, and you said never to like specify, do you leave that blank? No, you can give them uh, your if they give you a if they ask for a range and there's two fields, like you have to fill out two fields. Your okay. minimum should be your minimum should be the number that you want. The maximum could be whatever because they're never going to hit the maximum anyways. <laughs> Okay, so you said don't go under. So like if, if I feel that my experience, because I've been in the financial industry over 26 years, let's say. Fantastic. <laughs> long time. And so I, I strongly feel that like with my experience, my, my salary should be at least 40,000 or more. Mm-hmm. So should I put like 42 if my expectation is 40? Um, yes, you should put between, you should put some, like your numbers should be like 45, for instance, as your minimum. And then your maximum could be 55 because at 45, they're likely still going to give you 40. Okay. Gotcha. Right. But you want your minimum to be the actual number that you want because nobody, they're not, they don't care about the higher end They're If they know they can get you at a lower number, why would they consider the higher number? It's, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for a corporation to do that. Typically. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, Talking about the non-negotiable salaries again, but in a unionized position, because we know in unions, this is the salary. Uh, What can you negotiate in lieu of that where you can't negotiate the salary? Um, Oftentimes vacation, PTO, care days. Um, Benefits is a really hard one to negotiate. I I know like, you know, a long time ago, they used to say, you know, try to negotiate your benefits more for eye care. But oftentimes that's like an ironclad decision that came up, down into the insurance companies. You have no say. Like I currently work for a company where uh, our vision care is like, like $25. And I'm like, I can't get any, I can't get a McDonald's meal for two people for $25. But that's what like, there's no negotiating there. That's what they wanted to do. And that's the way it is. Um, However, but negotiating time off is a really good plus for you or negotiating volunteer hours or other passion projects that you want. Another really interesting negotiation that I found really worked is to ask for a monthly coffee with someone senior. Um, so I actually have a monthly coffee with, um, I actually have a bi-weekly coffee. Every two weeks I have a coffee with the president of our company and founder of our company that I negotiated into my contract. He basically is contractually obligated to speak to me every two weeks about anything. I'll take anything from him. And the reason why is because I want to put my face right in front of the person who's making very important decisions for our company, who's going to make big moves in the future. And one day when he does, I'd like him to take me along as well. So I, I did negotiate this, uh, you know, they, people wouldn't give me like an extra 5k and I'm like, then give me free coffees with the people that matter. <laughs> so that's a good negotiating uh, tool as well. Yeah, that is a good one. Um, a, oh, sorry, Sheila, one sec. I know that Elise has her hand up, her virtual hand up. I don't know if you want to come off mute and ask your question. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if you should always negotiate, like if you know, you've been offered something that you would take, even if you know that it's less than, than you deserve, but you like, you just, you want a job or the job, should you still negotiate regardless? Yes. So I think the, I think the um, confusion might be that people think negotiation is really just a combative experience about you want to give me a salary. I want more negotiation really is it's, it can be as simple as, you know, they say to you, this is the salary and this is the job. And you say, great, that's perfect. (laughs) And that's it. That's the negotiation. And then you can move through your interview process. I've had, so the negotiation can start with what's your salary expectation. It's, 40, great. This is a a 40K or 42K job. You're like, great. And then let's go through the hiring manager position. You're still, you're still part of your negotiation at that point is to prove out that you're worth the 42, right? By the end of it and get that offer. Um, So negotiation doesn't necessarily mean it's like, well, this is 42 and you're like, but I want 55 just because I'm supposed to say that. Uh, If you're comfortable with 42 or you want the job, just take it. (laughs) Okay, great. Um, Sheila, you're next. Thank you. I have um, an interview tomorrow. I've already. Congrats. Thanks. I've already 
interviewed like a just a appetizer interview and we discussed salary they were asking me well what do you want so i just told them 50,000 mm-hmm. i i didn't blurt it out i i thought about it for a few minutes you know minute or so and and I, it, I was hard pressed to say because I, I knew that the role was offering less, mm-hmm. but they said that they were really offering 35 to 40. Mm-hmm. And, and so now I want, well, if they're offering 35 to 40, I want 40, mm-hmm. not five. Right. And I would really settle for 45 because right. that be closer to what I'm looking for, be it just a little bit more than that. And I was just wondering, should I just try, like, I was thinking maybe I'll just try to hit a home run and then discuss the, the, um, the salary as, you know, I would be comfortable at 45 because I really believe that I bring a lot of skills to this position that they are not going to get from some someone else that is going to be paid 35,000, not a chance. Absolutely. And that is a great, uh, uh, like gut check that you have. That's like stick with that intuition. (laughs) Um, that's kind of the idea when I was talking about walking it back. Um, sometimes you say a number because you're like, "Mm, I'm going to go for it. And then you say what you say. And then they kind of go, that's not what we were thinking. Um, if that's the case, it's totally okay to say, you know what? I'm open. I wouldn't go in and say, I want 40 or I want 45. Say I'm open to negotiating. I'd love to learn more about the job. Can we book a meeting with the hiring manager just so I can get more information, but I'm very happy to negotiate given that these are my experiences and skills. So if they, because what you want to reiterate to them and kind of imp, like plant in their minds is like, uh, you know, if you really want this done well, you're going to need someone with this experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had, I've, I've been in positions with interviews too, where they were offering me like a substantially lower salary. And in those cases, I have said, okay, that's not a problem. I, I can't do that um, because what you're offering is for someone very junior in our industry. And what you're asking them to do is quite senior. So if you really need this job done well, you're gonna have to pay for it. And then they were like, no, we can't afford it. And I said, okay, well, no problem. How about uh, you just take your salary and just get two juniors and just train them to be what you want. I was helping them find the right people, but I wasn't gonna back out because I kept reiterating if you want this level of experience and I outlined that experience and this value, then we're, I'm willing to negotiate, but let's have, let's keep the conversation going. You're always going to want to keep the conversation going. You don't want the conversation to end. Right. Uh, One last thing, they're offering commission on top of that. Like fantastic. But the commission obviously would take a while to get rolling. And the, I know that they're going to use that against me. Well, you know, it is a position that will, you know, increase in pay as you get familiar and better. Yeah. So you know, I want to start with a good base so that I have incentive to get up and make, you know, the commission on top of my. Yeah. So that's a that's a great thought. Commission is a very interesting structure. I work also on a base plus commission um, OTE structure and I've had offers where the base was quite low and they said, but you get to make a high commission. And I was very clear with them. I said, listen, if your base is so low, what you're actually telling me is you're not going to invest in me. And you're basically going to only pay me if I've delivered to you first. But let if you invest in me, I promise I'm going to deliver to you. And so they eventually switched their mind and they said, okay, we'll give you a higher base. Okay. But, but I, I definitely did reposition their idea of how a commission plus a base should work. So it's totally okay to have these conversations because you have to remember their employer has to earn your trust too. <laughs> They have to earn you as much as you want to prove to them how great you could be for them. So it's definitely a two-way street. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Good luck. (laughs) Yes, good luck. It's exciting. Yeah. Um, Okay, Arlene, you're next. If you want to come off mute. Uh, Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So uh, um, my question, I'm a Black woman, and I've noticed uh, in applying for positions, Uh, especially government, there's often a form that asks you, are you of a certain race um, or, you know, Mm -hmm. gender, so on. Um, So sometimes I'm wondering, 
I've been told it's better to, to fill those out because it can help you a with salary or getting to position. But sometimes I feel is that a way of putting you in a category where your your salary might uh, it's, in other words, we're hiring you because of this, so your salary might not be as much. So I was just wondering, is it better to fill out those forms or uh, not fill them out? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, in terms of salary, I'm un, uh, to be fully transparent, I'm unclear if it does harm or better. I do mm -hmm. know that it does offer you an opportunity to actually, a better opportunity to actually get the job. Uh, yeah. I, I work on the diversity, inclusion, and equity committee on, on our, in the current company I'm at right now. My husband actually works in the government. Um, and, you know, having the, the initiative to have people uh, within the BIPOC community is really strong. And so they want to make sure that they are actively doing something rather than passively, like just hiring some of them be like, oh my God, thank God we are finally hiring people within yeah. the community that we need to be hiring. And so knowing that this exists will actually bump you at the top um, and it's, it's kind of the way it is as part of a, an act, actual trying to actively hire people of other communities so that they have a, a diverse uh, community or em, employee group. Um, so it would help, but I, I've never heard of it actually um, harming your salary. Um, oftentimes it can just be used as a way to make sure that the organization is being fair and is including other people. So um, I think it's helpful to fill those out, but it's always a personal uh, choice. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Perfect. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to write them in the chat. Come off mute. Okay. Uh, can I please ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Hi, Cher. This is Varsha. <clears throat> um, sorry, I actually I'm having a little bit of cold. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I will be starting an entry level position, and they asked me for salary expectation. I have not said anything, mm -hmm. and now I'm regretting like I didn't say anything, and I took it like whatever they're offering. Yeah, unfortunately, once you've done that, <laughs> done that, it's you can't. It's hard to go back. You can't really go back and negotiate it. But the opportunity you have now, uh, on the plus side, is that it is entry level position. You have a period of time where you can kind of uh, earn your keep or light the place on fire, so to speak. So you can go and you can crush it. Um, one of the best things to do is as you start, um, I would wait maybe a month or two and then speak with someone senior or maybe HR and ask like when the next opportunity for a promotion or a raise exists and what do you need to do in order to get that? Uh, so what are they looking at? What kind of qualifications they're looking at? And then spend the rest of your time, uh, give yourself a deadline and spend the rest of your time trying to actually hit those um, metrics. And then when you get into the raise or the negotiations for having a raise or a promotion, that's when you can ask for the type of money that you actually want. Does that help? Yes, it does. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cher. Thank you. And congratulations, mm -hmm. Sheila. Oh, thank you very much. Yay! You're welcome. Just to share on your new baby. That's oh, awesome. oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, okay. Any other questions? We have a couple more minutes. Uh, yes. Oh. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks for all this great information. I signed up. I mean, I, I logged in a little uh, late on the, or called in on the phone. Uh, I just wanted to find out if um, for women, because the, the workplace still is dominated by men. And when you get into the negotiation, um, is there any specific advice for women? Um, on uh, to go into the planning of it and conducting it and um, just because uh, I, I certainly have a male manager and um, it just seemed like it was really firm the um, the salary they were offering right um, and and that's that's a really fair comment I also work in a very male dominated <laughs> industry uh, which can be very challenging and for a long time I thought 
And maybe I should act more like a guy uh, and kind of do what guys do uh, as a way to kind of get ahead of this. But I actually realized that uh, as women, uh, at least from my experience, we actually have this incredible superpower. Uh, and I would lean into that pretty hard. Uh, so even though I've had, I've only ever had male bosses, um, very, very senior male bosses. And a few times there has been mansplaining and some chauvinistic comments and things of that nature. Um, what I have found is that one of the powers as we as women have is that we are, uh, and not to overgeneralize, but we are really well prepared and very poised. And we've also taken a lot of shit. So we know how to keep our shit together in the face of really obnoxious things. <laughs> so it's a really good idea that even if you go into situations where there is a negotiation and it is with a male, sometimes it's helpful to just be prepared. Um, and again, like, uh, you know, oftentimes we hear like, you know, men can just go in a room and be very demanding, be like, this is the salary I want, John, like, this is what we're going to have. And they think, you know, they get away with it. Um, I think that gap is definitely closing more and more as we start to see um, things change in the way, you know, the world is moving. However, um, you have to lean into maybe the fact that you're friendly and firm because you know women are often seen as friendly and nice people but being firm is not a bad thing so you can be friendly and firm at the same time and say you know i've done this and this and this and uh I deserve this and this and this. So I'm going to ask you to actually give me this and this and this. I've actually told a boss that um, you know, in a year's time, I had been there a year and I said, in a year's time, I would like this promotion um, and I'd like to lead this team. And he said, okay, we'll think about it. And then six months in to that year, I said, hi, I just wanted to remind you that I've done this, this, and this in the past six months. And so I'd like to get that promotion. And he said, yeah, we'll think about it. And I said to him, if I don't actually see that in six months, I'm going to just give you a heads up that I will be looking for a work elsewhere uh, because I, I've done this and this and this, and someone else is going to want that. Um, so if it's not you that wants it, someone else is going to want it. And, um, and then okay. we went into the one and we went into the six months later and it was COVID and he gave me some BS excuse that it's COVID. I can't do it, but do do it. And I said, okay, no problem. Thank you so much. And, uh, within a month I got a new gig elsewhere and made, uh, um, several, several 10,000 more in salary. So um, it was definitely worth putting it out there and letting, and me and that boss are still actually good friends because he respects that I went in, told him what I needed to do. And I told him it's, I kind of think of it like almost like dating. Like if yeah. you don't want what I have to give, exactly. then someone else will pal. <laughs> and I'm fine with that. <laughs> so don't be afraid to lean into being firm and friendly, but let, let them know your expectations. This is kind of what it is. Great strategy. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So in the interest of time, um, I will wrap it up. So thank you to everyone who showed up today and had amazing questions. Thank you so much. It's so important for you to show up for yourself mm -hmm. and, you know, you're your own person in this journey. And so who's going to look out for you if you're not going to look out for yourself? Exactly. So this is the first step of showing up, negotiating